Uh, last week, uh, we made it back. I talked about we had been in Kentucky over the holidays, and we made it back, and, and God kind of in my heart had me at the beginning of this year uh, looking at a series on kingdom investments. Pastor Tara started the year out, and she was just talking about from the book of Malachi what we're sowing and what, what that means for us sowing into ourselves this kingdom sowing that we do. And uh, I was thinking about sowing again this week, and, and you know, financial is what we think about when we talk about sowing. When we talk about investments, our minds go to money. And, and I tell you what, investments with money, I don't know about you, but that's something that just, I have to be in it. I mean, you can talk about stock markets, we can talk about Dow Jones, we can talk about NASDAQ, and we can talk about money markets and mutual funds and, and investing in, 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 in property or investing in gold or investing in this or that. And then this whole anomaly called cryptocurrency comes up that makes no sense. And my cousin's mining Bitcoin. And then I read articles and the Fed starts talking about uh, the interest rates are going to go up, so our investments are going to go down, and, and all the, the turmoil that's going. And, and you know what I do? So rather than sow, I like to stash. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I just don't get it. And because I don't get it, I don't want to invest it. And it's a pastor that's really been speaking to my heart because I believe that's what we can do spiritually. There's things that we just don't get. They don't make sense. You hear about it, someone else talks about it, and they've got computers in their mind, Bitcoin, that it makes no sense to me, so I'm not buying a computer unless I can play games. And we're missing the harvest that God wants if we're not willing to sow. And my goal as a pastor has been to look at some of the unpopular spiritual disciplines, the ones that we don't always look at, the ones that pastors don't always start their series on spiritual disciplines on. Look at them and say, hey, how can I help the church understand this investment better so that they choose to be willing to sow this? If you recall last year, this is not meant to bring guilt. This is just meant as an illustration. Uh, in spring of last year, we gave away pumpkin seeds, right? And I talked about those pumpkin seeds, and you can believe me or not, but from one pumpkin seed, I said there was the potential in one pumpkin seed in four years to provide 20 pumpkins for everyone in the world. And some people say you're absolutely crazy. I've got the numbers. I'm a math guy. Challenge me on it, and I'll win. <laughs> It's this exponential growth that comes. But the reality was, when it came time to reap, we didn't have a whole lot of pumpkins. We had enough. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and the question becomes, really, what happened with the seed? Now, I did it. Some people said, Pastor, I sowed it, and mine never sprouted. Okay, way to go. But I bet there's a lot of people that stashed rather than sowed. Some people may have tossed. <laughs> rather than so. And if we expect kingdom harvest, if we expect God's best for our lives, then we need to sow. And we're sowing in ourselves, believing that there is fruit that will come in our lives. I want to tell each and every person in this room, I don't care where you're at, I don't care who you are, that God has spiritual fruit that is good fruit that He desires to produce in your life. And that's fruit that's not just for yourself, but that's fruit that will impact and affect others around you. That's fruit that is life for someone else. Let's bring a guilt. What if there was a kid that the pumpkin had spread cancer that didn't have a pumpkin because you didn't sow your seed? You look at that kid who's crying because they don't got a pumpkin, they got a pump, pay an apple. It's that real with the kingdom fruit that God has for your life. And when we understand the investments, I believe we're more likely to engage in those investments in our own lives. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. Ecclesiastes 1, there's a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot. I believe that the season God is talking to us right now is a season where it is time to plant. I don't 
want to come to October, the time to uproot, the time to reap, and not have anything to reap because I didn't sow in this season. And I still got that seed. It's in my, it's in my closet. I'll put it in the ground now. You put it in the ground in October and you wait to see what comes up. It's a time to invest in yourself. I read these verses last week. This is where I'm at. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Have nothing to do with godless myths in old wives' tales. Rather, train yourselves to be godly. That's kingdom investment. I'm training myself. First Peter, Peter likes to say, make every effort. I'm showing some effort to train myself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness is value for all things. That's the eternal promises. That's the kingdom fruit that's coming in you and through you. Holding to the promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive. That's why we sow and we take care of. That's why we plant and we water. And that's why we weed and remove. That's why we fertilize and take care of. Because we put our hope in the living God who is a savior of all people, especially those who believe. Last week, I talked about the kingdom investment of, the, uh, of Sabbath rest. And I went as far as to say, if you're not affected as a follower of Christ, in practicing Sabbath rest, that's not just ceasing to do, but pressing into the presence of God for yourself. You can't be an effective disciple for Christ. That's how important I think Sabbath rest is. If I can't connect to God and allow Him to fill me up, how am I going to be used by God in, in touching others? You cannot be an effective disciple without Sabbath rest. We need to figure out what Sabbath rest means for us. That was last week. If you didn't hear it, it's online. You can listen to it later. This week, I want to use another word. It's an S word that a lot of us aren't going to like. It's an S word that I believe in our culture is so hard to comprehend that we struggle with it. The discipline, the kingdom investment that I want us to talk about today is the investment of submission. I don't like that word, Pastor. I don't know how churches use that word, Pastor. I don't want to hear about that word. Right. And if you can't handle it, go back. You know, I'm not going to get my feelings hurt. But that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. James chapter 4, and then I'm going to pray. It says simply, submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double minded, grieve, more and wail. Change your laughter in the morning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Submission is imperative for a follower of Christ. James wrote this at a time where people understood submission. I believe when James wrote this, people got submission much better than we get submission because the American way is not a way of submission. The American way, the, the way we do things, is not necessarily ingrained in this. I mean, James is writing this at a time there's kings and kingdoms, there's lords and, and there's slaves and there's masters, and people get when you say submit what it means. You and I, when you say submit, I'm not sure we fully comprehend what submission means. My goal today is to spend time in this room. We can discover what it means to submit, and we can train ourselves. To effectively live in submission to God. I want to pray, Father, we thank you this day that we're here. And I thank you, God, because I already know what you're doing in this place. And I pray that you continue to work in us. For us, God, we lay ourselves before you in these next few moments that our ears and our hearts would hear who you have. That we would receive from you, God, not, not, not in, in selfishness, but in what you need us to hear. As pastor, I submit myself to you, asking for your words to come forth. Praying, God, that your will is accomplished in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. So y'all know where we're going today. I'm going to look at three stories in Scripture. These three stories are ones that have stood out to me, and they just came in my life this week. I knew I was preaching on the discipline of submission, 
But these three different stories came about, and they resonated with me. The first one, I, I believe that biblical submission is hard to comprehend. I think for all of us at times, it's something we struggle with. I was reading a story in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Genesis. Now, there's two people, and, and their names change, so if I use their names, I apologize. I'll just say that right now. Abram and Sarai, and they become Abraham and Sarah. So give me that right now. Because I'll go back and forth probably as we're talking. And God has made a promise to Abraham. And that promise was what? He would have descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky. Many nations would come from him. It's the promise that God made to Abraham. Now Abraham has another problem. He's got a promise, but he's got problems. What's his problem? His problem is that his, his wife and him are old and they can't make a baby. They try to try, they can't make it happen. And so what happens in the, in the context of the story? This is in Genesis, we're going to be in about 15, and we'll actually go through about verse, or chapter 22. But the context of the story is, all of a sudden, Abraham can't have a child. Abram, at that time, can't have a child. So his wife gets this bright idea. Her bright idea is that I've got a maid servant. I'm going to send her, and she's going to fulfill this promise for God to you. So she sends her maid servant. Her name is Hagar. Now, I feel for Hagar in this story. Like, that's where I'm at. I have empathy for Hagar. He sends his maid servant, and, 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 and she's now, she sends her maid servant, and she's now pregnant. You know what happens to her? Now Sarah's mad. A woman scorned right now is what she's feeling. Scripture tells us that she despises Hagar. None of this she despises her, she mistreats her. So you know what Hagar does? What any of us will do? She runs away. Pregnant woman on the road to Egypt. She's going back home. I'm getting away from all of this. I'm getting away from this position. I'm getting away from what's going on. She's on the road to, to, to sure it says in, in Scripture, but she's basically on the road back to Egypt to get away from being mistreated and despised. Do you know what happens? An angel shows up. Now that angel, now did you or I show up and I see a lady who's been mistreated, who's on her way home? I want to say, get on my camel, let's go. The angel looks at her and says, you should submit to Sarah. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. And it was in the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. I want to tell you everything in American, everything in man, everything in flesh of Steve says, what in the world is this? You're looking at a woman who's been despising this tree and you're telling her, God, you're telling her through your messenger, that's what an angel is, the messenger of God, to go back and submit. I don't want to talk about her submission to Sarah, but her submission to God. You know how you did? She went back. She went back. God, I tell you what, that kind of submission, it's hard for me to, to comprehend. I'm going to say, don't you know what's happening there? Like me and Angel were having a conversation. Do you know what that woman did to me? Do you know how much she despises me? Do you know how much she missed her? We don't know what she did, but the Bible says she mistreats her. So I'm guessing it's pretty bad. Yet, because you said, I will go. Now, I don't know if you remember the word this morning, but, but that word that came to me, it was resonating with, with Heather's life. Because what happened in the word that, that God gave was, he said, I am the good shepherd, follow me. That's submission. But he also talked about hurts. We're talking about her hurts. So she goes back and everything's great, right? All of a sudden, now Sarah gets pregnant. She's got a young child. And Sarah's pregnant. And, and she has a child. And, 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 and Ishmael, he's laughing at something. Sarah gets so mad, she says, get out. Get out of the kingdom. Go. 
They fill up a couple wineskins and they send her back on that road to Egypt. She was hurt. She submitted and it was still hurt. But I want to tell you that God met her on the way. Scripture says that she goes in the desert. She's, she's going out and, and, and she runs out of water and her baby's crying. Can you imagine this? Tell you, I mean, submission, it's a hard thing to comprehend. Her baby's crying. She said, I'm walking over here. <laughs> I'm going to get away from that kid. Because we're just going to die here in the desert. And I can't listen to him cry himself to death. I want to tell you, on the road to submission, God shows up. God spoke to her from the heavens. And he said, I've heard your son's cries. He said, look, there's a well. He said, I promise you. See, they were worried. They, Sarah and Abraham were worried about Abraham's blessing for Ishmael. God said, I have a blessing for him, and I will still make many nations from him. This submission stuff, I think at times it's hard for me to comprehend. It's hard for me to understand because everything in me cries out, that's not right. It should be this way. Why is God going that way? Do I know why the angel said go back? I don't. Do I know why, why Sinatha kicked her out of the house? I don't. But I know that she listened to God. She did what God expected. And God met her need. There's another story in, in, in Genesis. And it's using Abraham again. Remember, Isaac was the blessing. It was the promise. And we know this story, right? God's going to make many nations. He's got one kid. He's got one kid. And what's he supposed to do that one kid? God, do you understand where many nations come from? Isaac's pretty important in this equation. And you want me to take him, my son, the fulfillment of your promise, and take him up on the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice to you. And I'm telling you what, I am not Hagar and I am not Abraham. I'm a kicker and a scripture. I need to train myself in submission. God tells me to sacrifice my son, I don't know how this can work. Oh, man, deal with it. How about I sacrifice someone else? Walt's got a great first son. Can I sacrifice his? He's a good guy. Abraham modeled kingdom submission. He modeled it to the point that he placed his son on the altar. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there. He arranged the wood on it. He bound Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. What kind of crazy man is this? I want to tell you that kingdom submission, the submission we need to train ourselves, is foolishness to man. I promise you, if you walk in submission, someone's going to tell you, you're crazy. I promise you that people are going to tell you there's better ways to do what you're trying to do. They're going to come along the road to Egypt and they're going to say, hey, there's some guy in Egypt that will take you under his wings and he'll raise that child that's in your womb. Just go that way. It makes more sense. There's someone that's going to say, don't offer your son. And he reached his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven. Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He replied, do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have, with, you have not withheld from me your only son. Submission. The definition for submission. The action or fact of accepting or yielding to a superior force or to the will or authority of another person. Think of the word sub mission. His mission is more important than mine. It's looking at something and saying, the plan that you have 
is more important than the desires that I have. The plan that you have, the way that you are leading. That's what the slave is saying to the master. That's what Hagar was saying to Sarah. Your mission is more important than me, and so I will put myself under your mission. One more story. And the sad thing is, I relate to this one much more. We read it in Ben's Bible study this week. It was in Luke, but I want to read the one in Mark. Mark chapter 10, it says, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was born. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. And he went away sad because he had great wealth. I talked yesterday in, in our wedding about the value of covenant and the reality that covenant is. This morning we were talking about the certainty of the Word of God. The reality is that submission either is or it isn't. There's no gray when it comes to submission. Why did the rich ruler go away sad? Because what Jesus revealed was he was not submitted to him wholly. There's no such thing as in and out. We have to be in or we have to be out. That's what submission truly is. That's what God is saying. The man's face fell. Why? As a pastor, I love this verse. I love these words. Kids, get, get ready to laugh because this man had a butt. The kid's good, the pastor gets to use it later. God, I can give you everything but this. That's not submission. Submission is being aware of your butt and where your butt is at. Submission is being able to look at my life, to look at me. That's how I train myself. Because all of a sudden, I will see there are things that are standing in the way of the mission that my God, my God has before me. And I'll recognize myself justifying and explaining why I can't sell everything. Because I've got a butt. I think God created us all with butts for a reason. Because we all have them. And we all wrestle with them. We all, we all have these things that God, I can give you everything, but they start speaking to our butt. And we just dig our heels in. And we're not going to go this day, and I'll get there in a minute, but I think that we need to bring our butt to the altar. Like that? Pastors all over the world want to say that. And I figured out a way to do it. <laughs> Romans chapter 10. It says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart you believe and are justified, it's with your mouth you profess faith and are saved. The scriptures say, Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That confession is hope bound. We miss what we're confessing because none of us know what Lords really are. That confession is is a declaration that my mission is under His mission. That His will is what is most important in my life. And I will position myself that I will do whatever it takes to fulfill the words that He speaks to me. So when He says, go back to that place of bondage, I'm willing to go back because I know that God says it. When He says, take your one and only and place Him on the altar for sacrifice, 
I'm willing to do what God has asked me to do because He is Lord. Jesus taught him this. He said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very soul? That's good. Peter, make every effort. James says, train yourself. I want to ask you this day, where's your blood? And what is that peace in your life? I have to train myself. I laid it yesterday. This is candid pastor. Joe, I'm not meaning this mean to you. I've confessed before this church that at the time, my allegiance to the Cincinnati Bengals was a sin in my life. I'm not kidding. I, I, I was in a church and we were two miles, from, we lived two miles from Cincinnati, Ohio, and Sunday morning when the Bengals played, I didn't care who was talking to me when it was kickoff time, I was going to get home so I could see that game. And I was probably leaving a little bit early so I could get debriefed from church and relax and watch the Bengals. So I get stressed out when they lost. God had to bring me uh, on, a, on a road to sure. He had to move me 1,200 miles away so that I'm preaching when the Bengals play. Do you know what happened yesterday when there was a wedding going on? <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Do you know what man said to me after the game? pulled up on my phone and you want to watch it. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that offer. Except for my walk with the Lord. And I knew that I couldn't disengage from where I was and engage in something that was not here because there was something more important before me. You see, God had a mission for me, and that mission is to be a pastor. And so that mission is that when people are here, I need to be engaged with them. I can still check the score and know when Tyler Boyd scores his touchdown, but I can't be disengaged to the point of not relating to people. And I promise you, if I started watching, you would start seeing a different person. <laughs> Ryan knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Submission doesn't make sense. Pastor, what's the big deal if you watched a stupid football game? Because God brought me out of that. And he showed me that there was something more important. And I can't go back there. So I have to align myself with his will. And I have to train myself to be able to look at the evil Joe and the evil boy and say, no, I cannot. <laughs> Sometimes it's not as easy as a football game. Sometimes God has to do things that are really hard. He says something like, deny yourself. He says, take up your cross. That's the, the place where you're dying. That's the place where this flesh in me and everything that in me wants. And he says, take it up daily. Why daily? Because we have to do this every day. We have to remind Steve every day. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives inside of me. I have to remind myself that no matter what God says, no matter how foolish it sounds, no matter what other tell me, I need to do it. Why? Because he said. That 
And I promise that daily I have to remind myself. And I promise that oftentimes I fail. But submission is recognizing his mission for my life. And no longer is it defined by my, by my failures, but it's defined by his desires for my life. And even if I screw up my position and his mission, he can still accomplish his mission if I will just walk with him in spite of what I've done. That's submission. This morning, I want to open the altars up. And I want to say to you this morning, if you've got a butt, bring it to me. Bring it to the altar, maybe you come forward and, and pray up here, maybe where you're seated, just acknowledging to God that God, I, I relate to that man who said, I can give you everything but this. But I recognize who you are. I recognize that you are Lord. Maybe someone in this place has never made the confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's where submission begins. Recognizing that God has a way. That He has a way that, that will bring fruit in your life. That He has a way that will bring abundance in your life. If you're just willing to say, God, you are Lord. I've been trying. I've been doing it my way. And I've done some pretty cool things. But God, I acknowledge that my way is not your way. And I want my way to be in your way. Not in your way, but in your way. Sometimes it means moving your butt. Sometimes it means saying, God, I gotta get you my butt. I gotta give you all of me. Father, we come to you this morning and I know you're speaking to hearts. And I pray, God, for the discipline of submission. That submission truly is hearing you and responding. And, and God, I pray across this room that, that throughout this message, throughout this day, throughout worship and the word that came, God, that you've been speaking to our hearts. And God, that we know what you are asking us to do. Each one in this room, God, recognizing what you've spoken to them this day. Left with the question of the ruler. You look at them and said, but what about your butt? Looking at us this morning, God, and saying, what about your butt? Saying, are you willing to sell everything? Are you willing to go back to Sarah? Are you willing to sacrifice your son? So that my promise my fruit Reap your harvest. I hope that we sow and not stash. That we plant and not toss. And train ourselves, God, to live in discipline when it comes to submission. In Jesus' name. We're going to lead us in a worship song, but I want to go back and just read the end of that verse in Mark. Because I believe this is the place that we're all like today. That Jesus, I think we've all heard his voice. We've been here, guys, have talked long enough, that we thought we You've heard God speak. We've all listened. That rich ruler heard Jesus speak, and he had a choice to make whether he would submit or not. And my heart would break if one in this place went away sad. He went away sad because he couldn't totally submit to God. Don't leave sad because God promised us joy. I will tell you there is joy in 
submission. There is joy in the walk with Him. Don't leave safe. Can you respond? We'll lead us in worship. The altars will be open. If you want to pray with someone else in the room, please feel free to do that. But recognize and ask yourself the question, am I training myself? Am I training myself for this discipline of submission? And am I doing this daily? Taking up my cross each day? Denying myself each day because his mission is about my very I'm going to speak of my sake, but if you want to remain in the sanctuary for a little while, you're more than willing to. I'll say the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. And may your mission be his mission. May you pray the words of Jesus, not my will, God, but your very will be done as I learn, as I train, as I grow in this journey of submission with you. Amen? Amen. Be blessed.